Hey, thanks to my good friend, Jeff Novers, for that kind intro, uh, all the stellar work that he does with our regional building trades. You know, without the great women and men of the local trades, nothing that I'm about to say today would be possible. And good morning, uh, friends. There's a lot of them out there in the audience today. I apologize I can't be there in person. You can probably tell from my voice I'm feeling a little under the weather. Um, I get sinus infections when the weather changes here in spring and fall and out of just an abundance of caution and not wanting to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I'm taping this on Wednesday, the day before uh, you're hopefully viewing it. Wish I could have been there in person, but uh, apologies for that. I want to talk a little bit about our title of the presentation today. And I want to talk about the first part of the title, which is The Awakening. Um, that is a tribute to the great Pittsburgh jazz pianist Ahmad Jamal, um, borrowing from one of his epic album titles, the best pianist in jazz history, at least for my money. But then there's the other part of the title for our presentation today, which of course references the next chapter in this epic story that is the domestic natural gas industry, Shale 3.0, right? Where our industry and our products, they're the catalysts for the economy and for quality of life and for lower CO2 emissions. And that's true not just for the region of Appalachia, that's true for this nation, and that's also true for the world. So don't call it a bridge fuel. Uh, make no mistake, we are the necessary catalyst if you want a better future. And if you want us to be a bridge, it's gonna be a bridge where society is not gonna like what's on the other side of it. We're seeing examples of that, unfortunately, everywhere you look these days. So what it comes down to are two very different approaches that are out there today. On one side, you have what I call the bridgers. And the bridgers warrant that natural gas is heading toward obsolescence, towards extinction. Um, bridgers, they employ mistruths and politics and fiction and mysticism. Um, their approach is wrong, of course. They lead to problems if you follow the bridger approach, big problems for society at large. And government, of course, what? Government's always going to be the decider when it comes to the bridger's view of energy policy. Now, on the other side of this debate, you've got us, and I'm gonna reference us as the catalyst. We know that natural gas is more crucial than ever. Catalysts live in the world of truth and of science and of reality and of fact. And our approach, of course, is the right one. We offer solutions for the region and for the nation and for the world. And of course, we know that the free market is the answer if you allow it to keep innovating and, uh, and bringing new technology to bear. Now the Bridgers, unfortunately, you know, they've been winning the policy game of late. You have to hand it to them. And how is it that you might frustratingly ask that a view that's based on the traits in those words that I, I put out there, right? Whether it's mistruths or politics or fiction or mysticism, how can it be that that is so successful or so successful an approach? It doesn't compute, it doesn't make sense, right? Well, actually and unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it does compute and it does make sense because the success of the Bridgers, it hinges on the application of a tried and true recipe used by manipulators and those looking to control for over a century. So the recipe was explained by the great author and thinker, Victor Klemperer, uh, when he lived under fascist rule in Germany. And I wanna thank Timothy Snyder for sort of igniting my awareness of Klemperer um, the recipe that Klemperer defined has four parts. It's a pretty simple one. First, you attack reality, and then you present in the void, you made up creations of facts. So you're attacking reality in step one, and then you're replacing that um, when you attack it and destroy it, these made up creations. The second step of the recipe that Klemperer defined is you apply constant and endless repetition. You're basically pounding the message everywhere so that no one can escape the perpetual exposure to it, whether it's on TV, um, whether you're reading about it in a newspaper, looking at it on your smartphone, surfing the web, or sitting in a classroom. Step three of the recipe that uh, Klemperer sort of defined or exposed, it's time, and I'm gonna borrow sort of some phraseology from the great essayist, Joan Didion, love Joan Didion, but it's time to apply some magical thinking. So here, under this step, reason becomes a casualty and people start to embrace what are blatantly untrue positions. And there's hostility under this step to any dissent or dissenter uh, to such untrue positions. So this is sort of the step in the recipe um, where your calendar starts to open up because you're not getting invited to panels and cocktail parties with the elite. It's basically an adult form of peer pressure. Now the last step of the recipe, step four, this is key because it's the whole point of the recipe. You offer up under this step the neat, simple, sort of loan solution to the problem 
that the prior steps have set it up for or have constructed. And the solution can be a messianic leader in politics, it can be a movement, or it can be a policy path in the case of energy and our industry. And that's the payoff, the step four, right? Whether it's in the form of money, power, or most importantly, control. So what I'd like to do is walk you through these four steps of the recipe that Klemperer has defined and list examples when it comes to energy policy and then rebut those examples with what we, the catalysts and the doers within the natural gas industry, what we know to be the truth. So let's give it a go. So let's talk about step one of the recipe, which again is attacking reality and then replacing that reality with made up creations. So the Bridgers have successfully attacked an absolute scientific truth. And that is that all activity in this world has a certain scopes one through three carbon footprint. And the truth, what's it been replaced with? That manufactured concept of a zero carbon economy or a zero carbon business or a zero carbon portfolio of energy. But we, the catalysts, we know that while lower carbon is absolutely possible, right? Zero carbon, it's scientifically impossible. And that the continued regional utilization of natural gas, particularly to displace less efficient forms of energy, that's gonna drive CO2 to the lowest levels and by the most efficient path. Now, another example of the bridgers at work in step one is sort of covering over reality with touting that the, uh, the comically named Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, and it's $369 billion use of taxpayer money, that's going to get about a 37% drop in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030. But we, the catalysts out in the room today, we know that the natural gas industry is gonna drop United States CO2 emissions by 30% by 2030 without the IRA, which means domestic natural gas, it's delivering over 80%, over 80% of the CO2 drop at zero cost to taxpayers. In the IRA, it's eking out less than a 20% total of that improvement in CO2 reduction, but at a $369 billion cost. How about Reggie? You see Reggie at work in step one of this recipe as well, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So Bridgers, they hype that Reggie is needed by warranting that state and the region's CO2 footprints, right, they're going to escalate significantly without action. It justifies the need for things like wind and solar mandates and subsidy through government intervention. But we, the catalysts, what do we know? We know how Pennsylvania reduced its CO2 emissions by 40% and how the United States reduced its CO2 emissions by 23% since 2005 through the utilization of more natural gas. The United States utilizes about 38% more natural gas today than it did in 2005. And this, I always throw this factoid out, I think you've probably heard it before, but if you didn't, it's a good one to remember. This would make Pennsylvania, if it were its own standalone developed nation, the only developed nation in the world that would have achieved its Paris Accord targets because of innovation, because of entrepreneurship, not because of mandates or implemented policy. Now, those pesky bridgers under step one of the recipe, they also press a popular, but a flawed notion that wind and solar, AKA renewables, they are carbon free. They simply are not. Ignored, of course, are the greenhouse gas emissions produced during the mining and the processing and the manufacturing and the transportation of all the materials that are needed to construct these facilities, as well as the activities associated with their maintenance and their service and of course their disposal not to mention the redundant fossil fuel backup power that's gonna be necessary and needed. So it doesn't matter if it's Department of Energy or the EPA or the Securities and Exchange Commission or various um, state energy and environmental agencies across the nation, you name the government entity, but where are they on this? How can we decide things like our energy future when we won't be honest about the basic carbon accounting? Okay, let's talk about step two. Step two of that recipe, pounding the message. The Bridgers, ladies and gentlemen, they really excel at this step. You know, think of all the catchphrases that you see and you hear everywhere. Code red for humanity, keep it in the ground, combating climate change, how many times have we heard that? Energy transition, zero carbon economy, on and on it goes. In the direct and indirect vilification of our industry, it's nothing new, we're used to that but you have to admit it is becoming more and more intense under this step two of the recipe. But we, the catalysts, right, we know the true message that needs to be broadcast, which is the region is thriving from natural gas and natural gas derivative products and vertically expanded markets for natural gas products, 
they're the answer. All of this benefits the local region and the local communities. And then there's another constant, I mean, constant mantra from the Bridgers under step two about how wind and solar are deployable at scale everywhere, including in places like Pennsylvania. But the common sense, rational catalysts that are here today, we know if we wanna lower global greenhouse gas emissions, then you deploy solar and wind in the sunniest and windiest places that still rely on higher emission sources to displace them. You don't place renewables at scale in places like Pennsylvania, where what, the efficiencies are low, the costs at scale are high, and the supply chains are thousands of miles in length, and the life cycle carbon footprints, they're all going in the wrong direction. For sure, we doers in the catalyst mold, we're asking, hey, what's better for the planet, for greenhouse gas emissions, and for the regional economy, and for business models? On one hand, sort of option one, making products overseas, using high emission, inefficient factories, which utilize poor labor and environmental practices, and having all that wasted cost and energy transporting these products all the way here to sometimes work, depending on the weather or what the weather's doing, or the other alternative, simply manufacturing these products here with low carbon footprint natural gas, more efficient power plants and factories that adhere to stringent environmental standards using local well-paid workers and shipping it within a one day's drive. I think the choice between those two options is pretty simple and straightforward. All right, let's talk about step three. Step three, again, I'm using and sort of conjuring up Joan Didion. This is where they apply the magical thinking. So Bridgers keep encanting that slogan of increasingly competitive renewable energy, right? You hear that all the time. And how natural gas or fossil fuel in general, it's bestowed lavish subsidy by taxpayers. But we, the catalysts, we understand the math of subsidy. University of Texas recently ran that math of subsidy for different forms of energy on an apples to apples dollar per megawatt hour basis. Now, what did the University of Texas find? Well, one to $2 a megawatt hour of subsidy for natural gas and oil, 15 to $57 a megawatt hour subsidy for wind, 43 to $320 a megawatt hour for solar. The spreads between that subsidy are massive, and that's the math of subsidy and the reality. Now, another related chant that you always hear from the Bridgers under step three of Klemperer's recipe is how the natural gas industry needs to pay what? Pay its fair share, right? And under the impact fee, severance tax, and you can call it whichever you prefer, in the end, it's, it's uh, one or the other, it's, it's really the math that matters. But under that severance tax or impact fee in Pennsylvania, in 10 years time, our industry of natural gas has provided over $2.3 billion in revenue to state communities and coffers. Who or what is a question we should be asking, who or what has paid more of a fair share than we have? I think that's a legitimate question to ask and we should, we should demand an answer to that um, from the different stakeholders across the Commonwealth. And how much taxpayer subsidy, by the way, um, in middle-class regressive taxation did the wind and solar complex enjoy in the re recent um, Inflation Reduction Act? Something, as I said, to the tune of almost $400 billion. Now, another magical thought that's applied by the Bridgers is that wind turbines and solar panels and electric vehicles, they're gonna be manufactured in the United States and in places like Pennsylvania. But we, the catalysts, know that under the laws of geology and under the laws of economics, that's never going to happen. And why is that? Well, because 68% of global nickel, 73% of cobalt, 93% of manganese, and 100% of graphite that you find in lithium ion batteries, they're controlled by a place known as China. This is the stuff that you need for wind turbines and for solar panels and for electric vehicles. And Bridgers, you know, they paint that rosy picture of sustainability in action with wind and solar. Never mind the reality that we, the catalysts, know all too well, which is child labor in open pit mines, acid runoff poisoning entire ecosystems, slave labor camps in Xinjiang and China, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this one, it blew my mind when I saw this, Scotland, Scotland cutting down 14 million trees to make way for wind projects. None of that computes as sustainable nirvana, at least to me. Now that ties to the bigger magical thinking um, concept of energy resilience that we hear from the Bridgers all the time. This is how 
wind and solar and electric vehicles, they're going to make the United States stronger and better positioned. But you know, consider the true evolution, basically where we were, where we're at now, and then where we would be heading under the Bridger's vision. So what we were first, right? We were a nation that built its grid and built its transportation fleet and vehicles. But what we relied, we used to rely on OPEC and Mideast oil to power them. Then, right, with the shale revolution and what it provided, we evolved to what we are today, which is a nation that makes its grid and its vehicles and also manufactures the energy that powers both. It's a really good place to be, an enviable place to be. But, you know, moving toward the Bridger's vision of the future, that's going to take us to a place that's the worst of all worlds, where inevitably the grid and transportation fleet, they're going to be made from stuff from China and Russia, and they're also going to have to be powered by energy from China and Russia. So Xi and Putin, uh, they would like to thank Western environmentalists and politicians and bureaucrats, aka what we reference as the experts, for what? For gifting them control of our energy and thus the geopolitical leverage that comes with it. All right, step four, we're coming down the home stretch. This is where, under Klemperer's recipe, you offer that loan answer. And this is, I said, this is the payoff for the Bridgers with the recipe overall. This is where a host of answers and solutions that solve the crisis and save the world, they come to the fore. And examples abound everywhere you look of this step of the recipe in action today. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, that's the most recent example of step four in play. Almost, as I said, $400 billion in subsidy and support for those in the favored caste. But we look, we catalysts, we look at the Inflation Reduction Act and we, we say, wait a minute, did anyone run the math to see how the proffered solution impacts the problems of global temperatures and rising sea levels? Well, when you plug the IRA assumptions into the climate models of the United Nations, which by the way is what noted climatologist Bjorn Lomberg has done, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Bjorn Lomberg. If you're not, you know, try to follow him. He does great work when it comes to a lot of this policy analysis uh, with respect to energy policy and climate policy. But when you put the IRA assumptions into the UN's own climate models, what Lomberg came up with was that the answer comes out to with global temperatures and sea levels. On temperature, it will have 0 0.0009 degrees Fahrenheit impact. And on sea level, 0 0.08 inch reduction in sea level. Now, if you work that out on a per degree Fahrenheit and per inch of sea level basis, the math says the Inflation Reduction Act is going to basically work out to a $411 trillion cost per degree of Fahrenheit and a $4.7 trillion cost per inch of sea level. And you thought that waterfront property on Lake Erie was expensive. Now, also in step four, how about the Bridger's answer of how a mad dash to wind and solar at scale on our grids is going to be a smooth transition? You hear that all the time, right? Well, the data are saying something different everywhere you look. Um, California, there's one example there, going from a best-in-class grid to basically a third-world grid. Energy-rich Texas, we saw another example there not long ago when it was starving maintenance investment to build unneeded wind and the resulting freeze crisis that ensued. To quote the North American Electric Reliability Council, quote, there's clear objective conclusive data indicating that the pace of our great transformation is a bit out of sync with the underlying realities and the physics of the system, end quote. You don't say. And things get worse when a realistic eye starts to shift globally. The anything but smooth energy transition to wind and solar at scale in Europe, what's it done? It's emboldened Russia to invade the Ukraine, tighten its energy grip on the EU, and it's sent inflation soaring. Meanwhile, Russia is selling its oil and natural gas to China. China then uses that Russian oil and natural gas to do what? To fuel its industrial sector to make wind and solar panels, solar wind turbines and solar panels, to basically sell to the United States and to the EU thereby increasing its energy leverage and fueling its militarization of places like the South China Sea. These policies that are promising the shiny soul solution, they've instead achieved exactly what they were really intended to do, which is to create energy scarcity, run up prices of energy, and restrict access to supply. 
Now, there are all kinds of other power grabs in this step four of the recipe, the solution final step, so to speak. You know, it's sort of how we end up with needing a climate czar who flies from elite confab to elite confab in a private jet. It's what leads to the Paris Accord and the United Nations positions that penalize the Ohio's and Pennsylvania's and West Virginia's and Virginia's and the domestic energy industry in each of those states so as to force false solutions that rely on China and Russia as providers. And it's why a U.S. National Economic Council director recently asked out loud, quote, the question should move from why should we pursue an industrial strategy to how do we pursue one successfully? That should scare and worry all of us. So I could go on and on, you know, but in the interest of time and in the interest of your blood pressure, I'm going to shift uh, to the good news in all of this. And there is a lot of good news. There's a growing awakening in our industry and across society that there's a better way than the bridge's road to certain ruin. And it's one where the catalysts and the word association that I put out there with respect to we the catalysts, where that applies and that view of the future applies. So let me try to paint um, some of that path for you. Natural gas, it continues to be a foundational fuel in the energy mix. In Appalachia and Pennsylvania, they play the lead role by fueling new industrial and manufacturing businesses and by supplanting foreign oil through things like compressed natural gas or CNG, um, liquefied natural gas or LNG uh, that are going to drive transportation sectors, both right ground transportation as well as aviation. Then you've got also Ohio and Pennsylvania and Virginia and West Virginia becoming the center for skilled labor job creation that's going to reopen a currently closed path to the middle class for our region's underserved urban and rural communities. We leverage the region's unrivaled work ethic. We create family sustaining jobs that don't require a college degree or I guess now the college debt forgiveness that goes with it. And we lower regional, national, global carbon emissions even further. The Appalachian Basin, it's uniquely, uniquely positioned to serve major nearby U.S. population centers. Our local natural gas, it's low CO2 intense, but it's very high energy dense. That provides unmatched greenhouse gas efficiency from an all-in scopes one through three life cycle analysis or perspective, which is, I said earlier, the way that we need to run the math and assess different options. And then investment in and utilization of our low greenhouse gas intensive natural gas and its derivative products, that's gonna use infrastructure that works with new technologies like hydrogen, if and when they're ready and able to be deployed. So engines and factories, of course, they can run off of 100% compressed natural gas or CNG or 100% hydrogen or related blends. So we don't need to wait or bet on when and how the hydrogen economy unfolds. We just accelerate and de-risk its arrival. Further, natural gas utilization, it's gonna reduce unnecessary shipping logistics for other energy sources, and that's gonna result in fewer transportation-related bottlenecks and transportation-related emissions. So when supply chains, they're stretching thousands of miles in length, we know, we found that out the past couple of years, how it can hurt reliability, cost, and also carbon footprint. So basically the concept, it's an easy one, right? It's build it here, make it here, use it here first. And technologies and assets that are being developed in Appalachia and from companies like CNX, now they can help displace higher carbon intense fuels in the U.S. energy mix and aggressively compete with wind and solar, both on a cost as well as a scopes one through three carbon footprint basis. All this is happening now. Um, two examples we currently announced at CNX, just to give you some perspective, partnerships with the Pittsburgh International Airport and with New Light Technology. The straws um, that we passed out there, I think, today on your seats, those are biodegradable, and they're made from abated coal mine methane as a feedstock. That's one of the products of New Light Technologies. You talk about a circular economy, just an awesome opportunity, and shows how pivotal the natural gas industry is on all kinds of follow-on industries. So I hope that you now see and appreciate how that ill-intended recipe that was defined by Klemperer but being applied by those bridgers and how policy is steered away from facts and science and what is best for Pennsylvania. We have to remedy that. We've got a duty to do so. And thankfully, we've got science and math and physics on our side. And over the long term, those things are undefeated. So we've got the right things on our side. 
if you follow math and physics and science, good things, really good things are going to happen. America and our allies, they overcome our dawning challenges that have been brought on by the recipe's ill-advised energy policies. Pennsylvania and Appalachia can grow markets and demand for natural gas vertically, not just horizontally. We'll keep energy affordable. We'll make things here again instead of on the other side of the world. We'll transform communities and countless lives in the process while achieving environmental goals. Those who want to eradicate our industry, they are not the answer. Bad things are going to follow, not the contrived solutions. Catalysts out there today, answer back and rebut with facts, data, and the unmatched quality of life that our work and our industry provide. We're the present, we're the future. The moral imperative is for societies to embrace our Catalyst product, not jettison it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I apologize again uh, for not being there with you in person. Um, you can text CNX Insight um, to 52886 for more information on the topics that I've discussed and to stay in touch. I'd encourage you to do so. Again, CNX Insight 52886. And you can contact me on Twitter at Nick Deolius. I again encourage you to do that. Check out the website nickdeolius.com if you get a chance or try to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm there under Nick Deolius. And by the way, order that book, Precipice, if you get a chance. If nothing else, all the net proceeds from the sale of the book will go to the CNX Foundation Mentorship Academy, um, which is looking to mentor high school juniors and seniors um, from Western Pennsylvania's underserved rural and urban communities. I thank you for your time and attention today, and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you out there on the front of public discourse.